of this start screen. Share screen. I haven't touched the code for a while. All right. Can you see my screen? I'm gonna to move the to chat here. Here, not here. People is gonna be here. Chat should be here. Can you see? Uh, can you all see my screen? Uh, the mic is okay. I'm gonna check my mic. Uh, right, the mic's good. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so <clears throat> let's move on. Um, this afternoon, I'm gonna check on your assignment. So make sure you submit them all. all right. There will be like a lot of. Uh, uh mistake in your code I, I guess like just yesterday Hung Ta, like he had like 20 lines of code and then i could make it just three lines so like i, I will try, try to give some more comments on your code All right let's go so today we're going to learn about two topics refactoring and error handling <clears throat> uh, it's, they are very important refactoring and error handling and i will explain why later right so now let's recap last week, uh, maybe not last week, the, the week before, even before that. So we learned MongoDB and Mongoose. So what are they? Ah, no, that's not the question, <laughs> actually. Uh, you already know. And so what is the MongoDB queries? So what are the, uh, what are the queries here? The queries here. So I'm gonna explain it as well. Queries here like, um, <clears throat> it's it's kind of like commands that we run in order to get the data from the database or we can insert or modify basically we are gonna do crude operation with our database right so we call it we call them queries and so what's are the mongoose methods so in order to answer this question it's gonna we have to go back to mongoose what mongoose does right so Mongoose is just a library that will have it's, it provide us a an interface kind of like an interface when you talk about interface kind of like a a tool that will help us use MongoDB within our JavaScript code easily right like convenient conveniently so we use Mongoose for convenience for a like a fast development. Right. Instead of having to remember all the queries, um, for example, file db dot collection dot file or dot anything, and then we have a lot of extra syntax in the object, the curly braces. So now in Mongoose, we can have less of that, and we can use something more JavaScript. It looks a lot more like JavaScript, and we also have a lot of methods, and there. If you look at the documentation here, you can see a model, model documents. So let's take a look at document. <coughs> so these are all method. Um, if you take a look, update one is method, right? Find one is also method, replace one is also method. And these looks a lot like JavaScript to us, right? And actually they are JavaScript. So that's how what Mongoose does and why we should use it. So basically Mongoose is an official library for MongoDB and it's very famous. There's a lot of pro and cons of Mongoose. For example, if we want to be like uh, much customized, we have to go back to MongoDB. Oh shit, my screen. We have to go back to MongoDB queries. So for the standard or for the basic or even intermediate methods, we can also use Mongoose Right, like this, we can have a lot of method in Mongoose and we can have a lot of customization. But if you're so advanced or you're so pro, you may have to go back to MongoDB. I'm pretty sure. It's the same with uh, SQL database, the same thing. In SQL database, you're going to have a, an ORM. It's basically an object relational data mapping. Basically, it's the same with the Mongoose here. but uh the functionality is the same but uh, if you go, go um, you get advanced or you are pro you may have to go back to the pure 
you are called pure queries right so basically the pure query is the same as mongodb's query <coughs> right uh, so that's it for the database and I, i'm not going to talk about all the more the queries uh, i i i myself don't even remember all of them like i just know how to use them and what i i expect to see in return for each method Oh shit, my screen is, is turned off. Sorry. And I have some problem here. Shit. Ah. All right. Uh, for model, we have uh, methods for model. We also have middleware for models. As you can see, we can define model uh, middleware for our model. And can you give me an example of uh, 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 the middleware for models? Model here is provided by Mongoose, right? It's provided by Mongoose. I'm going to open the code and show you. Yeah, valid. Oh, yes. Validation is kind of like a, a build in middleware for mongoose yes right oh i didn't i didn't expect this answer yes uh i'm gonna open the code yeah but it's it's actually an uh, a middleware for mongoose in mongoose so you're gonna have so we can define the method here these method belong to schema actually but when we talk about model we uh, actually talk about model and schema at the same time right so we can have middleware free and we can also have post. I, I don't have it here, but uh, maybe we're going to create one later. But we can have free or post middleware for model. And here we create methods for the model, right? So this is a custom method, right? I hope it's not uh, so, so strange to you. All right, so that's how we define method and middleware. <clears throat> uh, it's a lot uh, different. Uh, we, um, I'm going to show you. Uh, mm, having only one screen with everything on one screen is so hard to use. Mongo, Mongo TV. So here is the method, uh, the, the queries. Let's say transaction, not this. How do I find? Okay, hi. There we go. This is the MongoDB uh, query. We already know. It's kind of uh, similar to Mongoose, but uh, for more, so you have something like this, right? That's very hard to use uh, if you have so many conditions or you have so many nested condition you're gonna have a lot of uh, this kind of syntax this kind of uh, phrases right and actually you're gonna miss one of them I I'm sure so it look, looks so uh, not this one yeah <laughs> something like this it looks so weird but mongoose have a, uh, a lot it's like it minimizes the code to the same so you're gonna do the same thing with less code and we make less mistakes so that's why we need mongoose, right? But then if you have a lot of condition inside just one query, we will have to go back to Mongo, MongoDB. Great. It's now it's the same with uh, an OIM. Uh, let's move on. Refactor. Oh shit, this is, I have uh, all your files here and I have a chat window in just one window. It's so hard to see. All right, uh, we know how to write methods. And we also know how to write uh, custom middleware. And we also learn modeling relationships. So we have two kind of relationship. I, I mean, two type of um, modeling the relationship in our models. So we have embedding and referencing. You need to understand these two approach. They are very important. So can anyone? explain or answer what is embedding approach and what is referencing approach. So let's go from order. 
Yeah, uh, everyone can't laugh. So I'm gonna ask Jared. You just had a haircut. <laughs> uh, you are mute. Right. Yeah. So, so why so is it embedding? Uh, I'm gonna start with referencing because I'm sure about that. Mm. Uh, so we used referencing for tours, and it's basically where you just show the object ID. You reference the uh, yeah. So you can either do child or parent referencing, mm. but basically you just mention the object ID, which references back, and you get the data that you need. All right. So yeah. why why do we choose reference referencing instead of embedding? Um, it's not fixed. You can basically adjust it how you need. You only, only include the fields that you want. You don't have to follow the whole structure and have all the, all the data sets the same, if you will. Exactly. So we use referencing uh, so that whenever we want to change the data in the, uh, the reference document, we don't have to check it all in all the places. We only change it in one place. Right. Yeah. So that's why we need referencing. And but using referencing is kind of slow. Like comparing to embedding. Like I mean, when we query, when we run the query to find all the results, and if we use referencing, we will have to run additional queries. I think did I explain it? I think for example, yeah, I think I just made it. For example, if you have um, a document and inside document you reference to tr another three documents, right? Three fields and that three fields, those three fields will reference to other documents. So we need to run additional three, three additional queries just to get the information from those three fields. So that's why referencing is kind of slow when you run uh, the read, read operation comparing to embedding <clears throat> and actually uh, referencing is how c code work that's how c code work before that uh, mongodb only only have the embedding technique it doesn't have it didn't have the referencing and as time move on it learned <laughs> it's like it's evolved it had the uh, referencing as well and i think that's how mongodb it's kind of like it's a future I guess. So we have four, we already have four version. We have uh, right now we have the first and four of MongoDB. Go away. Uh, here we go. If we can see correctly, uh, we have 4.2. It's, it's kind of like evolving day by day. Right. Uh, it's Mongo reference similar to uh, similar to speed two. Cool reference. Mm -hmm. Good I think I think I still think um, the SQL speeds is a little bit faster. Yeah. Because by default SQL is built with the mind of using re referencing. So reading with SQL using referencing is uh, just a little bit faster, but it's very hard to uh, scale later on because when I when I say scale, I mean like um, in the future you may have you may want to add more fields to your document, right? So for example, right now your document only have three fields, and then in the future you want to add more fields in the documents, and in SQL you cannot do that. In SQL, if you want to add more columns. Fields in uh, NoSQL means columns in SQL, like a table, and you have columns. So if you want to add more columns, you have to uh, you have to uh, give default value for those missing uh, values for the existing data. So it's very hard to add more columns in SQL later on, comparing to uh, NoSQL. So that's why when you say uh, scale means you want to change something in the future or you want to add more data and then you want to extract them, put them in separately in different database. So they are called scaling. And you will learn it um, when you actually work. <laughs> For example, if you want to work, uh, 
uh, when you go to work, you may have to deal with the more the Firebase. Firebase is very much like MongoDB and it's kind of like famous for now. It's a trend. And you usually use Firebase with um, front end. So Firebase is kind of like um, a, a serverless data base, meaning you don't need to use a, a, a back end at all. Firebase can act as a back end as well as a database. But uh, it's, it has a lot of cons comparing to uh, a an actual backend. So you have to know how backend works here first, and then the next level you can learn Firebase. Right. So Firebase, the structure of the database, is the same as MongoDB. It's also a NoSQL. So if you learn MongoDB now, it's very good. Like uh, it helps you a lot when you learn Firebase. All right. Enough of uh, that's that's off topic, but uh, let's go move on. <clears throat> we also we also learn how to use controllers, right? So we basically we have a lot of uh, controllers for each route, and we also learn user authentication, and this is a very important concept. We have two concept, uh, we have two approach for user authentications, and we only learn one. There, there are two different kinds. Um, let's say there are uh, server side authentication and by an ABI authentication. So what we learned is ABI authentication. We didn't learn uh, server side authentication at all. For server side authentication, we're gonna use cookies and yeah, cookies. And we're gonna for that we're gonna need a something called passport to have it with that. But it's off topic. We don't want to uh, learn that for now. It's the old way of using um, to build web application. For now, we only learn how to build ABI uh, ABI backend. So we only learn ABI authentication, which is what we what we already learned uh, the last two weeks, right? So we need a token. And we need a token whenever the user log in, we generate a token and then we give the user that token. And in the future, the user will use the token to communicate with the server. So it's very simple. If it's, it's a lot, kind of like a bit more complicated if we use server side authentication. And that's why we need to use Passport, and Passport will help us to deal with that. And we already learned login require, which is user authentication. We also can specify which kind of user we want to authenticate, right? And we want to authorize. For example, right now you only uh, authorize the uh, member or not member, right? In the future, in your real application, we maybe you want to authorize admin or just um, a normal member or a VIP member. So the logic is the same. When you check, the auth. So I'm going to show you the code here. So is so when you check the auth here, right? Instead of the auth here, the auth here. So instead of checking, is that just a user? We can have additional logic. For example, we can check if that user is an admin, or if that user is a, a moderator, or is that user a a VIP member? So you can, you can have more logic in here, right? Not just about, is that a user in our database? For example, in the user model, we can have the type of the user, for example. So we can have something like a type, member type. It could be an admin by default, for example. Right? And then you can check that field. We only uh, show you the, the basic and then you have to think, you have to be more creative in your project. Right, so that's enough about recap. Right, so right now you have done on the project, I suppose. Do you have any questions? Right, do you have like anything that's unclear to you? I think this is a good time to ask. 
I know that uh, when when you have no idea what you're doing, and then that's why you you couldn't have uh, like you didn't have any questions. But now you have done your project. Do you have any questions? I, I suppose you should have. Any question? If there's no question, I'm gonna move on. Yeah, virtual are a little bit confused. Yes, exactly with the virtual. So I'm gonna explain the virtual again, right? Virtual, virtual, virtual are very powerful. So basically, on the on the data that we don't want to store inside our database, but we want to show, we want to return to the user, right? We call them virtuals or we can call them the virtual field so for example virtual field, field. Uh, you may need to do something uh, like this mm. for example right now you only have for example first name and last name right but if you want to return a full name you may have a virtual field here that will combine the first name and the last name whenever whenever the user run the query fine and we're going to return that field as well and that's field that's data the full name is not stored inside our database right it's only generated whenever we run the queries and we call them virtuals and in order to return the virtual like for example when we do uh, respond.json and we want the virtual to be include inside the response here we need to have an option called to json virtual true okay virtual is very powerful you can calculate the for example if you have rating for your commands for your reviews and you don't want to store the average rating at all maybe maybe you want to store it or maybe you don't want to store it but you don't actually uh, have a, a field for every rating you only have a field for each rating in a review right and how do you start uh, how do you calculate the average rating you have two ways to do it and we will learn in the future but um, maybe you will need a virtual field in order to calculate the average rating right so can you explain the difference between virtual uh, i'm going to do you see my chat? Do you see the window chat? The, the chat window here? The Zoom chat window? On the screen? No? Oh, okay. I'm going to copy the, the question here. So, questions. Sorry, that and I, I didn't show the, the question on the question earlier. So, can you explain the difference between virtual and two object when you delete certain field of the object? Right. Good question. So, we have two options here, right? Two JSON and two object. Basically, to JSON here, when we want to include the virtual field inside our JSON object, when we do JSON dot uh, um, maybe document dot JSONify or respond to stringify or anything. So basically, any method like this is behind the scene is gonna do something like this: JSON dot stringify, and we're gonna have for example user doc here, right? So under the hood, this method. When we have the option to json virtual true so when we run this method on the virtual field will be included in here so that's answer the first part the virtual and actually these are not together they are they are not related at all they are not related at all so uh, next so two object virtual true or virtual false why do we have virtual false here i don't know but to object for example when you do to object here right you want to include the virtual or not so if you have false here means when you do user dot two objects you will not include the uh, the virtual and in here i don't have any virtual but if you give it false when you do to object you will not have the virtual fields but you have if this one is true you will have the virtual field that's a bit different right these two are they are, they, they are not related at all at all they are different options so uh, this option is gonna be um, is it included in 
the object when to doc dot to object right is virtual included right we have to use a new item but also is when we get item ah actually we don't we don't have to use to object but in some case we want to use to object for example here in this case um, i use to object because i want to make a copy of all the public fields and i want to delete some fields inside i want to delete some keys inside the object right so that's why i need to use to object cool and there's an option that uh, mongoose, mongoose provide us so to object virtual true of virtual phones it means do we want to include the virtual fields uh, when we do to object here or not right it doesn't mean like when we create new item yes. so when when you do uh, dot file you can also use to object here as well okay delete that any other questions no all right let's move on today topic is not that uh, complicated but the code the code is very <laughs> mind blowing <laughs> so uh, the concept is okay is easy but the code is hard so it's all about back end it's all about coding code all right let's the first topic is going to refactor and what exactly is refactor mm -hmm. what is refactor refactor is I oh shit i think i have a, a, a one more line here explaining what the refactor is but uh, refactor is very simple. It's basically you rewrite your code, right? Rewrite your code without changing any anything about the output. For example, your code here, if you use Popin and you run a an API here, you receive this return, return, right? This data in return. When you do refactoring, you change your existing code, but the output is doesn't change. It should not change, even though you change your code inside uh, your code base. So that's what refactor means. But why? Do, why should we use it? Why should we like refactor our code? There's many reasons. Basically, uh, for example, in Google, they will like refactor the code every two years, and you can imagine how big the their code base is. Right? It's very huge. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, code and there's a lot of feature, but they refactor their code base every two years. And by doing so, they can like update their code to be more, how do I say, um, to be more in sync with the current, the current state. And refactoring is very hard. It's not, it's, uh, it's not so hard, but you, it requires you to understand your code, completely understand of your code. That's why here's a, a lot of reason why you need to refactor your code. Maybe you repeat your code a lot, or your logic a lot of times. For example, in your project, you may have create, update, and delete controller, right? Inside your controller for create tool create review update tool update review delete tool delete reviews so you re actually you repeat a lot of the logic here if you take a look it's very similar so here i'm gonna create a tool create a tool here is how you create a tool right so something like this and this is how you create a review it's very similar there's a lot of similar, uh, similarity when you create uh, uh, a tool or you when, when you create a new review. Maybe you want to, when you delete, oh shit, I don't have delete here. But when you delete a tool or you delete a review, it's very similar. 
right? The controller is very similar. So why should we have, so why, sh why do we have to repeat the code for the same logic? We can refactor our code in order to not use the same logic every time. So basically, uh, instead of writing five functions or six functions, we can only write three functions to do the same thing. So that's how we repeat the code. And yeah, so that's why when you add, you want decide to add more feature or you want to fix something in that function, you don't have to go into uh, create tool. You don't have to go into create review or create user. You can just go into one function, create, for example, create one. And then you fix that function. You don't have to go into uh, different places to fix the logic. And another reason here is your app.js file is too long now. If you take a look at the, the app.js, there's a lot of shit here, right? And it's just such a very small app that only have a tour and a review and a login function, right? What if your application have a lot more filter? For example, you have live filter, you have rating filter, you have follow filter, you have so many filter that look so much like your Facebook, right? And your app at JS is gonna like explode. There will be a, a bunch of browsers here user you have uh, friends you have follow you have likes you have uh, whatever a lot of things so that's why we need to refactor our code like we want to separate the router into different files smaller files or we want to group the routes in one group for example all the reviews here should actually they should be in the tools follow after the tools but they in a different group but it should follow after the tools right So this code, I did it three or four months ago, and I didn't even look at it. So now, uh, tomorrow, uh, this afternoon, I'm gonna, I'm gonna refactor this code to make it a little bit better. Right. Another reason is when you look back at some function, you have no idea what you did there. <laughs> I expect you guys, <laughs> that happened a lot to you. Right. Now, if I look at this again, what the hell? Right. It's already been like two, three or four months, and when I take a look at this, I will be like, oh shit, what I did there. Uh, let's go to my um, tour model. I have a bunch of things here. And yeah, so basically, you when you refactor your code, you want to read your code again and understand what you did there, and then you fix it. If there's some problem, you fix it. It's a lot, it will have the, uh, your, your kind of like your colleges to understand your code better when you you decide not to work in that company anymore and then you want to move on to a new company then someone has to take over your job right and that person needs to understand your code if you write a bunch of shit in your code and that person is gonna like ah oh, shit it's gonna be a nightmare and trust me when you read the senior code you will like oh shit he did it so simple but it's so effective at the same time. Less code, but it's cover a lot of cases. Comparing to our code right now, it's like we write a bunch of lines, but just to do one thing. That's why we had to look back, look back at our code and try to fix it. Not really fix it, try to make it better. And that's how I actually teach myself as well. So every time I do it, I redo something, I do it in a different way. Uh, maybe it's shorter, maybe it's longer, but if it's longer, it's gonna cover more cases. Like you, when you get experience, you will like, whenever you do, for example, task number one, you have to think ahead. For task number two, you have to foresee the possibility. For, for example, you want to add more feature later on. So how do you do that? How are you gonna do that? You have to prepare yourself right now. You have to define a function that will have a possibility of adding more feature later on instead of doing everything just to make it pass for now. So that, that's come with experience. 
Don't worry, we learn day by day. So we will learn more feature, and then when you do that, the very simple feature you have, you have to give it more rooms for it to expand later. And here's here's a mistake. Uh, what we are making mis the mistake we are making. Many of us write the same code without refactoring at all, or without looking back and make it better at all. Even me, <laughs> I did this one three or four months ago, and actually in the lab, you will see a little bit of differences uh, comparing to how I did it. So every lab is a little bit different, and uh, that's the reason why I, I actually didn't, <laughs> I didn't look at my old code at all. And that's a bad habit. You should you should avoid that. So here, refactoring what is refactoring, and it, it's very simple. You rewrite your code or restructure your code without changing its external behavior or uh, external output. Or you can say output. So basically, we're gonna change our code without changing anything in the output here, right? So here's a very Cool website. Shit. Uh, it's a very cool website. Yeah. If you want, if you decide to read about refactoring, there's a lot of thing here. There's a lot of concepts, a lot of refactoring technique that you may want to uh, research. For now, don't worry too much about refactoring. For now, worry about how to make it work first, and then learn how to refactor it later. All right. So this website I think is very cool. All right. So there's a couple of reasons why and when we should refactor the code. As I said earlier, you refactor your code to have a better understanding of it. Or you may have repeating the logic a lot. All right. Or you may want to adding a new, you may want to add a new feature to your application. But when you when you do that, you you, you figure out, oh shit, I have to change a lot of things just to add just one feature. And that's not really effective. When you change something in your code, you may break it. You may break your whole app, right? Something will be uh, like broken. If you change this, this little piece of code, this little live code, you may break another feature and that's the uh, that is the uh, how do you say it? that's really bad it's a badly design so you may want to write your code that when you want to add more feature it should not break the existing feature that's why we need to refactor our code to make things completely separately separate and sometimes you may see like uh, when debugging your code, your application, it's like you have to randomly debug, check this, check that. You have no like steps at all. So you don't know where to start when you run into a problem and you don't know where to start when you want to debug something. And that's why you need to refactor your code in the uh, logical order. For example, if you run into problem A, you need to check step one, what you want to check, step two, step three, and that's how you figure out the, the bugs and fix it. So that's why refactor is very important. And in this, in our application, there are a lot of, a couple of things that we can do to make our code better, make our application better. For example, here, we can uh, restructure the route, the router here. Right now, we have all the router in just. Uh, Apple JS, we can separate them. For example, we can separate the tool in the tool router. For example, like this tool router. And then we can do the same thing for reviews and users and authentication, right? So this afternoon, we're going to do that. It's going to be our first to milestone. And we can do one more thing, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, this one is easy. We, we also learned the nested router. Basically, uh, it's, it sounds complicated, but it's easy. It's a complicated, complicated, but easy. Don't worry. Also, we refactor our handlers, right? So right now, we're repeating the logic here in the controller a lot. Uh, 
uh, not this one, sorry, this one. When we create a new review, we repeat the logic, right? Comparing to with the uh, tool controller right here. So the logic is pretty much the same. And the same thing with read tools and read reviews. Also re a single review and single tool, they are very, pretty much the same. Just a different in the model and a little bit different in the ID. Oh, what the hell is lean here? Okay. Uh, all right, this is the whole way. Uh, the old version of Mongoose, you need to use dot execute. I always said it before. That's why this code is so old. <laughs> and go back. Uh, instead of having many different functions to do root operation, but we can just have three functions to one to create, you know, four, one to create, one for read, one for update, and one for delete. We have four functions to do create, read, update, and delete to review as well as user. But user is, is used for user is a little bit complicated because we have to do it with authentication. So so may not we may not use user in our when we refactor our handler and we also learn about error handler handling so right now right now when you go to postman and say um on tool shit uh uh for example i give something bullshit here and I send, obviously, I cannot get any response because I haven't started the server yet. Sorry. NPM run dev. So basically, right now, our error, we have to handle the error one by one, right? As you can see here, we want to handle the error one by one. So when we fail, we have to use to cast something and then we send the message one by one. Also, if we want to send a custom message, we, we do something like this to not file and we have to do it manually in different routes. And that's not convenient. That doesn't like make sense because programming is all about automation. <laughs> we want to have one thing, one function to do a lot of things. We don't want to repeat this line over and over again. For example, I hate repeating this. And that's why we need a route, uh, an error handler, an error handler. Also, we want to show different errors or different results depending on which environment we are running on. For example, in development mode, we want to show all the errors. We want to show the whole stack of errors for easier to debug because it's easier to debug. But for production, we don't want to show all the error to the user. We only show the message. For example, here, if I enter the wrong, the wrong ID, right? And then I want to see all the reviews. It should be not found. Why? Oh, maybe. Not. All right, not found here. See, not found the document. Not found. Actually, it's the uh, the tool not found. So this error, we want to show this error to the user, production user. But in development mode, we want to show, for example, document not file, and we want to show where it's go wrong, right? We want to show which line is all wrong, or which file is all wrong. So those information are called stack, error stack. Basically, in a in a stack, we will see uh, where the error is coming from, and somehow it's gonna give you some recommendation on how to fix it. I hope. In some in some framework, for example, in Python, uh, Flask, it gives you some recommendation on how to fix it, but here it doesn't. So basically, we want to show different errors to different type of user, right? Uh, where am I? So you may have right now you may have a production environment and development environment, right? Production environment is like uh, on Heroku and development environment is on your local machine. So you may want to show different results to different user. And also sometimes your app's gonna break because of unforeseen problems. And you also have to handle those kind of errors as well. For now we don't we, are, we haven't we, we don't have any function to do that. 
we will also learn this one in the afternoon. So here's an example of the different results for development mode. When I send a, so if you look at the, uh, the results here, the status the error. I don't know why I say I call it error, but uh, yeah, it's error. And here's the error stack. You see a lot of uh, information here telling you which line is wrong and which file. So right now, I don't know, uh, something wrong in the validation here. And if you trace, 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 you will see the results in which file. Right now, I don't have, but you should see it. Uh, I have um, bum, bum. mongoose. Mm. Right, so basically it fell on the validation and on the tour validation. It fell right here because I didn't submit any guys, I think. Yeah, other guys not found. Oh, here. So this development is tell you a lot of things. It tell you where the error comes from. But if you look at the production error, <laughs> just one line in value input data, right? You have no idea what wrong, uh, where what wrong uh, went wrong here, comparing to development. Right, cool. And actually, in uh, development mode, you want to show the error five hundred, meaning something wrong in our code, right? But in production mode, we don't want to show that. We want to show, all right, you revise something wrong. It's not my code at wrong. It doesn't go wrong. It's yours. It's your problem. <laughs> Don't do that, actually. Uh, yes. So here's the version mode. You only show the message. You don't want to show the code. And in order to do that, you have to manually use try catch. For example, that's what we have been doing. Try and catch in every single route, and we turn a different result in every single route here, which is not so productive. Right? We can use another div, another way. So we can use create a middleware to handle all the error for us. Right here, redefine here. So basically those error messages, we already define them beforehand, before we return, right? So we redefine a set of error messages and then we pick them depending on what's the error status, for example, if the status is 400, we want to return something. Uh, what the hell? Not this. Uh, uh, what was it? Oh, sorry, it's here. So if the status is 500, we want to uh, 400. We want to return this kind of message, right? That's how we uh, we define the error messages. So we turn different error type uh, messages for different uh, environments. I will say this. It's so complicated, but uh, we only do it once, and it's pretty much copy and paste. Copy and paste. You can copy and paste a lot here for error handling because it's a middleware, and the idea of middleware is it should be isolated. Like it should be like um, yeah, separated. You can reuse it a lot, so that's why you can copy and paste uh, like more than half of it in this project and then move to another project right so sometimes it's it's included in the boilerplate or you can say in your spread generator it has a little bit of error handling middleware for you but it's not customized at all so that's why we need to learn how to customize them okay and after you do it once or twice you're gonna copy and paste it into your final project you don't have to worry too much about it. It's something you only learn it once and then you can use reuse it a lot of times. And it's very complicated, yes. <laughs> but you can copy and paste, yes. And that's really much about the theory. I, I think I went too much. The theory is very simple, but uh, the core is hard in this week. It's, uh, this week it's very hard in the code and very easy for the theory. Any questions?
So make sure you have all your code for the tour, the tour block. And this afternoon, we're going to refactor it. We're going to add more error handler. We will refactor the router. We're going to refactor the, the controllers. We also um, have error handler, right? Before having any question, I'm going to show you what we're going to do this afternoon. Oh, shit, so slow. What is this? Sorry, uh, this one. Right. So basically, we, we refactor our routers, right? And we also refactor our handlers. These, these are controller people. We call they uh, they call them handlers or controllers. Doesn't matter. They are the same. They are one thing. And we also define our hand error handlers instead of uh, manually return error one by one. We're gonna create an object for all the on the errors, and we also create a middleware to automatically select the error messages for a type of error. So our lab will have three parts. Refactor the routers, which is um, pretty much easy. And this one is a little bit tricky. And error handlers is more like um, you see me do it, and then you can copy, paste. Uh, but it's very useful catching the error in async function. All right, any questions? Shit, it looks so complicated. Right. After the course, do we have a set to learning bottle? Mm. Mm hmm. Let's see. Let's see if I have uh, a set to. I suppose you should have. Yeah, I suppose you do. Unless, unless we the the one who managed the learning bottle change something, I suppose you should have uh, access to learning bottle. Yes. But I don't think you will have access to the the most the updated. Uh, materials you only have access to your your course material i think yeah yeah i think i think uh like uh 90 percent sure that you will have access to your materials yay we will learn some more advanced concept of javascript i have and spread router and uh, you also learn the nested route uh, and that's the most confusing part for router it's a router not that so hard and you also learn handler factory this one hard. oh I think I thought oh, shit this one is not updated I'm so sorry I think uh, the handler factory basically Handler factory is like, um, I don't know why the slide here is not updated, but uh, handler factory is kind of like a design, a design pattern, not really design pattern, but it's a, here we go. Mm. Here, it's called factory pattern. Basically, you want to uh, have a function that will help you do the same thing, have the same logic. How do I say? Hmm. I think uh, factory factoring and shit, I'm going to show you one later. Sorry, I think so basically um, factories is kind of like it's a concept, it's a design concept, design pattern. Basically, you want to have as the name say, it's a factory, right? It will produce things that looks very similar. For example, here, create a tour, or create a reviews, or create a new user. They are pretty much the same logic. And you're gonna have a factory called, for example, create one, right? A factory called create one. 
and react one one here it could be one could be a tour or it could be a review or it could be a user so we have create one to create all the things for us the only difference is the only difference is the model right and for that we can use a model as a parameter uh, as a, an argument for this function that same thing goes for update the tour we can say update the tour or update a review and we want to have update one something like this and these are factories right and it's a very good design pattern you will hear this term a lot um factory pattern in c yeah it's a design pattern you now you learn a, a new design pattern it's more advanced but uh, i think it's better to know this cool shit there's a missing slide for about this one uh, let's go um, sorry uh, i'm gonna check um, local host. Mm. Where, where is it? Where is my, uh, oh God, it's gone. All right, sorry. I should have that one slide explain about the factory design button, but basically it's a, it's very simple, even though, yeah, it's a whole design button, but it's very simple. You have one function to do a lot of things. That's very similar. That's it. And you will see why we do that. It's very convenient. Any questions? If there are no questions, let's uh, go back at uh, in normal. Like, oh, every time this guy asks, it's going to be uh, an interesting questions. I'm going to copy the call, uh, the question here and put it here. All right. So in normal project, you have to work with other coder who also did the error handling and we have to already have to compile it. We should repeat the error again. If not, is it better to do the refactor after merging rather than before? Hmm. So we call it error handling is like, uh, it's a middleware. And the, the idea of the middleware is like, it's very, uh, it's kind of like separated, meaning we have one function that will do a lot of things for us. Basically, that function is kind of like a standalone function. It doesn't like depend. It does not depend on other calls. So for example, in our, our lab here, we will define a middleware that will capture all the errors and then return a custom message for each error. And for that, we're going to need the just one error handler. That handler will handle all the errors, not in your code, also in other people's code, right? So that's why we need only one error handler. And if that person uh, inside the code base, and there's actually an error handler already, so we don't need to uh, redesign another one. If we already have one. So, you know, what? refactor already. Refactor actually, um, there's no fix, there's no fixed way or fixed approach to refactor the code, right? Depending on your logic, you want to refactor your code differently. So that's why this lab is not so realistic, but it shows you how to refactor your code, how to use a uh, factory. It's not so like realistic because you in different routes, you may want to you have additional logic that the other route doesn't have. For example, when you create a new user, you may want to check the email if it exists or not. You may want to check a lot of things. It doesn't have to be uh, great. It doesn't look like how you create a new review or a new tool. You have to worry about more things about more things comparing to review or tour and to refactor that it's not it's impossible it's not it's, it's almost impossible to uh, 
group them into one group for some user tool and review into one group it doesn't work like that but we learn how to use factory and refactor means the idea of refactor here is like we want to write out code that it will not break when the user the new user want to change something or want to add more feature to the code base so that it's not going to break the existing code so refactor technique and uh, refactoring technique is very hard actually it's like advanced so right now we only learn how to do it like a beginner Uh, it's for the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Her error error handling is like uh, it's gonna capture all the error in your applications. Yes, and there are two or three levels of error handler, but for now we only learn one. The whole project and refactor is for in the video code. Yes, 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 yes. So the hard part is like when you join a team, right? When there's a team already and you join that team, basically they will have some uh, factories. They will have some factories and you don't know that. When you define a new route, you just add your own code in there without using their factory at all. Uh, that's a bad habit. That's a bad practice as well. So you need to learn how to use their factory. For example, if I have a factory called update one and when you when i join the team i already see this update one factory and if i decide not to use it for example if i want to add more update for example command i want to create another controller called update commands without using update one it's gonna make our my code look so silly compared to others as well as if you want to go and change something or another developer another coder want to change the logic inside update one they have to go into my function here and then change it as well that's a lot of work for them comparing to if we decide to work inside the update one right so the question is do you want to spend more time to uh, work on the factories or do you want to spend less time and work on more features so when when you refactor you have to uh, answer that uh, question okay it's about it's all about uh, trade-off you want to spend more time to make your code better or you want to spend more time to work on more features it depends on your boss as well Uh, questions and actually Google I think Google like they refactor the code two or three years every time they refactor the code and as you know <laughs> they have a bunch of apps and each app is like huge and they have to refactor them every two years which is very insane And that's also a, a new way, a, like a, a way to have the new employees to get accustomed to their existing code base. You spend a lot of time reading all the people code. Like at the beginning of this call, we already said about like 70 or 80 percent time of the developer, you read all the people code. Cool. Okay, questions? Uh, no, no, no. So the topic is very easy, I think. <laughs> it's very easy. Uh, someone asked me. What the hell? The uh, the theory is easy, but because as you can see here, it's very um, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, actually, for the error handler, I did it two times. <laughs> The rest, uh, the rest of the time, I just copy and paste <laughs> because there's nothing different at all. You just understand how it works and you can copy and paste. So there's a lot of copy and paste. You call it uh, boilerplate.
there's a lot of explanation on how to use them. All right. Okay. Let's take a break and then we'll come back at um what's my way? It's like it's some kind of like uh for example um, it's kind of like a, a code that doesn't actually change if you want to create a, a new project, right? For example, let's let's think about uh, let's take a look at our code here. Right. There's a couple of lines that will exist in every app. Guess what? Express, uh, because Express, these line of codes, we are going to copy and paste all the times, right? When we create a new project, we're going to copy them all and paste in another file. So these, these are kind of like boilerplate, right? You can create a new project with these line of codes already inside your code, your, your project. And then you make that project a boilerplate, meaning you can copy and paste that project and keep on working on that these are bullet like uh yeah there's nothing different right they're the same same so in Node.js, there are a lot of boilerplate that you can copy and paste which is why it's so simple comparing to other languages for some of this uh, any other questions because before we take a break and what time do you want to go back uh, we resume the word the lab let's, let's vote uh, maybe I'm gonna ask people to vote but I think the sooner the better and uh, until like 12, uh, 10 minutes until, let me take a look at the lab here, like you, you, you have to eat uh, lunch, right? Have lunch, right? So let's see if I can make it right. It, it's going to be long. <laughs> it's going to be long. Uh, uh, it's going to be long. So uh, actually, I don't have lunch. I learned how, right? All right, uh, cool. So take a 10 minute break and then we will do some work and work on mice on one and two. They're easy. So 10 minute break and work on two. Right. 10 minute break. All right, cool. All right, see you guys.